John Harris Hall, 1781 to 1841. A man who changed the world, who you have never heard of. 51-year-old John Hall and his wife, 42-year-old Statira Hall, may well have risen one morning in 1832 and looking north from their second-story window of their nicely perched brick home that Hall had so lovingly landscaped and gardened and beheld the same view the British artist William Bartlett captured on canvas seven years later. Their six young children would perhaps be roaming joyously over the spectacular sylvan scenery of Harper's Ferry. It had been 13 very hard years for them since coming from Maine, but not enough to make them leave. John Hall was, in making millions of detailed decisions, was going to succeed in changing the future of the world's way of making things. With each spin of his balanced pulleys, each blow of his tilt hammer, and each straight cut of his heavy milling machines. Eli Whitney, the Connecticut inventor, had in the early years of the 19th century misappropriated the mantle of inventor of interchangeability, when actually he better defined the problem, not the solution. He created sample locks for sure, but not a system whereby he or anyone could produce exactly identical locks or muskets in volume day by day. He was limited by the tools he used, a grindstone, an anvil, file, and knife. Above all, he did not ever produce a line of muskets that were demonstrably interchangeable, even when they were much less complex pieces when compared to the breech-loading rifle that Hall developed. John Hall, then in his 30s and working with a partner in Maine, was recognizing that only a completely new system of manufacture could produce true interchangeability of arms in great numbers. His early patented work caught the collective eye of the United States Ordnance Department that oversaw the armories in Harper's Ferry in Springfield, Massachusetts. They were still smarting for a solution to the biggest problem during the War of 1812, that of American men when finding their muskets defective for the lack of a part replacement, dropped the weapon on the field and fled. Never shy, Hall wrote Thomas Jefferson, July 15, 1818. Jefferson had been interested in French efforts at interchangeability when he'd been our ambassador there. I have succeeded in combining in one piece all the advantages of the best rifles and of the best muskets with other important advantages possessed by neither of those arms. And all this has been effected with great simplicity. I shall tomorrow set off for Harpers Ferry, Virginia by the direction of the government. I shall remain there six weeks or more and should wish, if agreeable to you, to enter into further communications upon the subject of America Militia. Most respectfully, I am, sir, your obedient servant, John H. Hall. Hall was contracted initially in 1819 by the War Department to produce 1,000 breech-loading rifles, receiving $1 in royalty for each finished weapon. And it was called the John Hall 1819 Breech-Loading Percussion Rifle. Hall's arrival was met with hostility and fierce, dedicated obstruction by the local powers that be throughout his 20-year tenure at Harper's Ferry. The armory's head, James Stubblefield, when Hall arrived, took pride in the fact that he could make a musket by his hands and tools, perfect unto itself in three months, replete with beautiful inlay. He could only see before him a sharp-talking innovator, an undiluted Yankee, who challenged all that Stubblefield held dear and was allowed autonomy 
in his own pilot operation that could draw funding away from Stubblefield's armory operation. Often, Stubblefield and his like-minded successors preserved the jobs doled out at the armory to unqualified cronies who were of the right political party and taking any congressionally mandated budget cuts out of Hall's operation, leaving Hall with his skilled workmen unpaid for months. The Shenandoah River's flood surges every few years and the almost daily rain of live sparks from passing Winchester Potomac trains always threatened Hall's worksite of disheveled wooden shacks, barely usable anyway. But his team, under his leadership, inexorably carried out Hall's visionary instructions to perfection while the Federal Armory on the Potomac side of town slopped along doing bad work or no work for pay, a haven of slacker political appointees who knew nothing about the work required except for the attached benefits. The Federal Inspector, General John Wool, visited both the Armory and Hall's Rifle Works and reported that Hall's works functioned with great regularity, order, and system whilst the armory was the reverse. One wonders why the War Department rejected Hall's obvious desire to work at the existing Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. It appears the War Department wanted him close enough to Washington, D.C.'s Ordnance Department that his work could be monitored. The workforce in the earliest days in the northernmost Shenandoah Valley also had a culture of highly resourceful apprentice system German gunsmiths who had developed the Kentucky Long Rifle for the Revolution. All this was keenly known by direct experience to George Washington when he resisted all entreaties in the 1790s to not have the armory put at Harper's Ferry in the first place. The untold challenges of the frontier had made the area's blacksmiths like James Rumsey and the Sheets gunsmiths extremely resourceful and innovative. Above all, the existence of the Springfield Arms Factory in Massachusetts encouraged giving a promising project to a southern state, particularly since the Secretary of War at the time of the agreement was South Carolina's John C. Calhoun. Colonel George Bomford, the Ordnance Department's steadfast and foremost proponent of Hall and the Uniformity Principle, strongly proposed hiring Hall to work at a Federal Armory location, and Calhoun made the final decision. Hall inched toward his true goal. He wrote the interested War Secretary Calhoun, May 15, 1822, who would later visit, The principles upon which my tools and machines have been constructed are applicable to every species of small arms and have for their object the production of perfect uniformity with the least possible expense, and when completed, the machinery will answer as well for 100,000 of the guns as for 1,000. As work progressed, Hall wrote Secretary Calhoun again on December 20, 1822, with a bold claim. I have succeeded in an object which has hitherto completely baffled, notwithstanding the impressions to the contrary which have long prevailed, all the endeavors of those who have heretofore attempted it. I have succeeded in establishing methods for fabricating arms exactly alike and with economy by the hands of common workmen and in such manner as to ensure a perfect observance of any established model and to furnish in the arms themselves a complete test of their conformity to it. Hall was addressing the premature claims of Eli Whitney 
Hall's greatness lay in the four years from 1822 to 1826, when he worked exhaustively to create more than 63 gauges of supreme accuracy down to one thousandth of an inch tolerance. He also designed his own machines, and even machines that made the part-making machines, so that they regularly produced results free of what Hall called minute errors caused by changes in temperature, by abrasions and subtle variations caused when machines had been set in large wooden frames. Ostracized by the town fathers, Hall had lots of time to do his work, and Statira had a growing family to keep busy while ignored. The problem of true interchangeability did not bend to the will, imagination, and intellect of the formidably motivated John Hall either quickly or easily. But he had a key insight going for him and his team of workmen. He believed he pinpointed a method of measurement to replace the old method that always failed to make two complex things exactly alike. Hall wrote what he called one of his most important contributions. In making a part of an arm like a prescribed model, the difficulty is exactly the same as that which occurs in making a piece of iron exactly square. In such a case, a man would square the second side by the first, the third by the second, and the fourth by the third, but on comparing the fourth side with the first, it will be found that they are not square. The cause is that in squaring each side by the preceding side, there is but imperceptible variation, and the comparison of the fourth with the first gives the sum of the variation of each side from a true square. Hall separated this single action into one, an unchanging standard, gauges, and two, an action then taken in the workflow determined by the gauge reading. To the workman, two yes or no decisions were required on each level, whereby an unskilled operator would make a perfect weapon. Each gauge was a pair of measures, today called go or no go gauges for each part, one gauge showing a measurement that was the maximum acceptable, the other a gauge showing the minimum acceptable measure. The workman made two unvarying choices per part. And so, in manufacturing a limb of a gun so as to conform to a model, by shifting the points, as convenience requires, from which the work is gauged and executed, the slight variations are added to each other in the progress of the work, so as to prevent uniformity. The course which I have adopted to avoid this difficulty was to perform and gauge every operation on a limb from one point, called a bearing, so that the variation in any operation could only be the single one from that point. This bearing strategy leads to Hall's first breakthrough, extraordinarily accurate gauges with which to confirm the accurate size of any one of 63 different parts of a rifle. How does one achieve such unprecedented precision needed to really achieve interchangeability or Hall and Bomford's uniformity principle? 